Welcome to the Middle East Policy Forum event on what's next in Yemen. I'm Rupa Rangaswamy. I am the State Department practitioner in residence here at the Elliott School. Thank you for joining. Today we plan to address the state of play in Yemen and the trajectory for 2023. Next year, as you all know, we'll mark the 10 year anniversary of this particular phase of the conflict. And next month is the eight year anniversary of the Saudi led coalition's intervention in Yemen. So as far as the context for our discussion today, last month, Hans Grunberg, the special envoy of the secretary general on Yemen briefed the security council that the pause in major fighting had created space for dialogue and diplomacy. As everyone will recall, the truce that was in place for six months last year was not formally extended. Grunberg assessed that the situation on the ground is stable with no major escalations or dramatic changes to the front lines. So we will hear from our panel about the situation on the ground, the likelihood of another ceasefire, prospects for negotiations, the regional implications, as well as the US domestic angle. As far as the choreography for this session, after we hear from the panel, we'll move to the Q&A portion. I will start off with a question or two, and then I'll pose a few questions from the audience to the panel. Please submit your questions in the chat. Let me introduce the panel. We have three distinguished speakers. Anel Shaleen is a research fellow in the Middle East program at the Quincy Institute. She completed her PhD in political science at GW, where her research focused on religious and political authority in the Middle East and North Africa. Yazid Al Jadawi is a research coordinator at the Sana'a Center for Strategic Studies. He previously worked as a coordinator of youth focused projects at the Youth Without Borders Organization for Development and as an education program manager at Nahta Makers Organization. Ahmed Nagy is a senior analyst for Yemen at the International Crisis Group. Prior to his position at the ICG, Nagy was a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Middle East Center where he covered the conflict in Yemen, the borderland dynamics, local governance, transformations, among other issues. So we will start off with Anel, then go to Yazid, then Ahmed. So over to you, Anel. Thanks so much, Rupa. It's really a pleasure to get to speak with you all. I, um, as Rupa mentioned, I'm a, a GW uh, graduate, and I'm currently sitting very nearby GW in Foggy Bottom at our offices and have my my IMIS mug here. Um, so it really is wonderful to get to, to talk about some of the work that I've been doing at the Quincy Institute looking at Yemen. Um, and I, I do hope that my, my colleagues will correct any, any errors I make because their expertise greatly exceed, exceeds my own. Um, but before getting into kind of the US policy side, I think it would be helpful to provide just a little bit of background um, apologies if this is unnecessary, but just wanted to give a little bit for, for people who may not be as familiar with um, the context of what is going on in Yemen. So I'll also try to keep my remarks relatively short um, and then can go back to explain if, if things are unclear. But from, from the US policy side, essentially the, the US involvement goes back to the decision by the Obama administration who decided to support the Saudi military intervention, which was launched, as uh, Rupa mentioned, almost exactly eight years ago in March of 2015. Um, and this was because at the time, the administration's primary goal was the success of the Iran nuclear deal or the JCPOA. And the they hoped that by supporting the Saudis, Riyadh would be less vocal in its criticism of the deal which they knew the Saudis would probably criticize. Um, and at the time, Mohammed bin Salman, who is now the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, had only been newly appointed the defense minister. He was not yet crown prince. Um, his father, Salman, had become king of Saudi Arabia just two months earlier in January of 2015. And MBS promised that the war to defeat the Houthis would be over in a matter of weeks. 
But here we are almost eight years later. The Houthis remain in charge of Sana'a, the, the Houthis uh, as they're often referred to in English or Ansar Allah. Um, they also control the territory inhabited by almost 80% of Yemen's population of about 33 million people. Just a little background though, the Houthis do not control Yemen's oil resources, without which they will struggle to hold on to power in the longer run. This, for, for example, motivated their latest campaign in February of 2021, which began in February of 2021, to take the oil infrastructure near the city of Marib, and they're prevented from doing so due to stiff resistance from tribes and inhabitants of the region, as well as Saudi-led air support. Another crucial thing to be aware of in the context of Yemen is the non-payment of salaries. So both the Houthis and the internationally recognized government refuse to pay the salaries of public sector workers living in Houthi-controlled territory. And these are the backbone of Yemen's economy. Uh, so therefore, the failure to pay salaries are a primary driver of starvation in Yemen. According to the World Food Program, 23.4 million Yemenis depend on humanitarian assistance. But due to insufficient funding, 17 million Yemenis still lack adequate food. So there's, there's absolutely insufficient assistance getting to the population. Um, the Houthis have grown increasingly powerful over time through their control of the, the institutions of the state in Sana'a, um, including the media, school curricula, which they use to indoctrinate the next generation, um, in an ideology which prioritizes rule by the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad. By teaching this, they seek to reestablish the social order that prevailed in northern Yemen under the rule of the Zaydi Imams who were overthrown in the 1960s when the Republic of Yemen was established. So to bring us up <clears throat> to the contemporary context, we've seen um, signals from Saudi Arabia and its coalition partners like the UAE that they're looking for a way out of this conflict, um, especially given signals from US Congress, um, which has repeatedly made um, uh, signaled that they, they may be looking to vote to rescind any ongoing US support for Saudi military actions in Yemen. So we saw this under the Trump administration when Congress passed a war powers resolution. Um, this was the first instance of the use of a war powers resolution in US history following the establishment of the War Powers Act in the, in the context of the Vietnam War. Trump vetoed that resolution, so it did not come into effect. Um, but since then, we did, for example, see um, in December, Bernie Sanders announced that he was going to reintroduce a war powers resolution. This was met with significant pushback from the Biden administration. Um, from their perspective, the, the U.S. Has been, um, has been contributing significantly to negotiations in Yemen through uh, Special Envoy for Yemen, Tim Lenderking. And so the administration's assertion was that this was the wrong time for a powers resolution, this would empower the Houthis or embolden them, um, and instead, in order to return to the truce, uh, it was important to, to keep the U.S. involved, in, up, up into including the possibility that the U.S. would continue to support uh, Saudi airstrikes, if those should resume. Um, all of this, the context for this does go back to um, a bit of a switch on the part of President Biden, who had initially campaigned on holding Saudi Arabia accountable for its human rights abuses, including the devastation of civilian infrastructure in Yemen that has contributed to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, according to the UN, due to starvation and disease. Um, so when he took office, Biden did reverse an 11th hour Trump decision to designate the Houthis a foreign terrorist organization. This decision had been roundly uh, condemned by humanitarian organizations because it would have made it even more difficult to operate in Yemen than it already is, as these groups do have to coordinate with the Houthis in order to distribute aid to Houthi territory where the majority of Yemenis live. Um, Back to the truce, it was in March of last year that the Houthis, Saudis, and the internationally recognized government agreed to a truce that did end up lasting for six months. It expired in October, but remains effectively in place, at least to the extent that the Houthis have not launched drones or missiles across the border at the Saudis, and the Saudis have not restarted airstrikes on Yemen, which they do with assistance um, from U.S. military contractors. So where we've where things are now and where my colleagues will be able to offer um, uh, much, much deeper insights is um, the possibility of a, a possible uh, a potential deal between the Houthis and Saudis 
Um, this says there are rumors flying that the the current truce might be extended such that the, the Houthis and Saudis would agree to no more cross-border attacks. There has been some concern though that this would in fact leave the Houthis as the strongest military actor on the ground. And so for, for Yemenis who are fearful of what that would mean for the future of Yemen controlled by by Houthis, there's there's resistance to a deal like this that that they see as um, as empowering the Houthis and not empowering the the non-military actors in Yemen who have been for the most part completely excluded from efforts at conflict resolution or negotiation. Um, uh, there, just one more background or just one more kind of update. There has been talk about an effort to get the Bernie uh, office to reintroduce the War Powers Resolution before the anniversary of the military intervention in March. Um, according to representatives from Bernie's office, they are in contact with the Biden administration. Um, you know, conversations are ongoing, but um, Bernie has said that he will reintroduce the WPR. However, at present, it is not clear that there would be sufficient votes because when when this measure passed the passed both houses of Congress previously, it was partly a vote against President Trump and the ways in which he was working very closely with Saudi Arabia and was seen as a means of, of um, condemning what Trump was doing, whereas now it would require uh, largely Democrats voted for it last time, it would require them to vote to go against their President Biden, um, which is uh, something that that most members of Congress would be unwilling to do. So it's not clear that Bernie would have the votes if he should end up reintroducing the WPR. Sorry for being long winded. <laughs> I'll stop no, there. Thank you very much, Chanel. Over to you, Yazid. Thank you very much, uh, Prova, and thanks for the Elliott School for, uh, of International Affairs for organizing and com uh, organizing this event. and convening this uh, stellar panel. Uh, very interesting background that Anel has provided. Uh, I just uh, to uh, speak on the prospects of another ceasefire, uh, what we have today and what we see today is a reminder of the situation that we had in the last months of uh, November 2021. Uh, Anel has uh, uh, referred to the Houthi uh, uh, assault on uh, on Marib, uh, in which they attempted to seize the uh, oil-rich government, but they uh, faced severe resistance from the local tribes there and the forces loyal to the Yemeni government. Uh, the way I see the situation similar uh, is that while Saudis were also engaged in supporting the tribes to defend Marib, they were also engaged in back-channel talks with Houthis. And there was a lot of progress there, and everyone was expecting that Marib would eventually fall uh, in the hands of Houthis, and everyone was prepared for that. Uh, be it the Office of the Special Envoy, the UN Special Envoy, uh, the European Union diplomatic missions, uh, people on the ground, everyone was almost prepared and ready uh, to deal with the new reality. Saudis were also, or have made, or had made progress then uh, in their talks with Houthis. Uh, U.S. had a very uh, had 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 an important role in pushing for the talks. Uh, this came after the visit of uh, Dick Sullivan, uh, the national security uh, the, the, the national security advisor of the Biden administration. His visit uh, to Saudi Arabia uh, in September and uh, uh, the, the the pressure he 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 uh, exercised uh, on the Saudi. Administration on Mohammed bin Salman, uh, in particular, uh, on the end uh, on the need to end this conflict, uh, everyone was preparing for hearing the opening of Sana'a Airport as part of uh, as a part of a larger deal with uh, between Houthis and Saudi Arabia. While the UN didn't have much to do in designing that sort of deal between Houthis and Saudi Arabia, but Iran had always a say in at least at least affecting that hardline wing among Houthis. Uh, because then we saw Houthis attack and storm, I wouldn't say attack, but storm the US embassy uh, in the later months of November. 
and everything just turned upside down. And when everyone was prepared for Houthis to seize Ma'arib and then moving to the next step, uh, in, in, in which Houthis would uh, urge the Saudis uh, to eject all the foreign forces uh, in the south, and Saudis were almost prepared. The, the, the only uh, difference or the, the, the challenge between the Saudis and Houthis then was on the opening of the airport, uh, Sana'a airport, and the destinations of the flights. Houthis were insisting on flights going uh, to Lebanon, to Beirut, while Saudis were refusing uh, that, and that was a sticking point at that time. Now, we're almost in, in, in a similar situation to some extent, uh, in which Saudis are engaged in uh, back-channel talks with Houthis, and uh, Saudis seem to be today more confident that they're making progress. Actually, they were preparing for organizing an event on uh, the first week of March, uh, the, 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 the King Faisal Center was preparing for organizing an event, and they were hoping that they could invite Houthis, or at least the, the uh, Houthi president, Mahdi al-Mashab, to go to Saudi Arabia. Now Saudis are working on rehabilitating their image, uh, especially after the killing of Khashoggi, uh, after the boycott of uh, Qatar, after all the, the, the sorts of uh, controversial issues they've been engaged in and reflected very bad diplomatic image uh, in, in the Western's eyes. Uh, Saudis now are hoping to reach a deal with Houthis, uh, and they were hoping to, to announce that deal uh, by the 10th anniversary of the conflict or the, the 9th anniversary of the conflict. Uh, they were confident that they could organize this event, but uh, apparently uh, they're preparing to postpone that event or they're moving to postpone that event uh, until after uh, Ramadan, after they convince Houthis to attend the conference. What is also different today uh, is that Saudi Arabia now is not in the best time in terms of its relationship with UAE. Uh, UAE has also uh, felt uh, felt frustrated that all these back channel stocks are now in the hands of Omanis and Saudis while they were sidelined. Uh, when UAE feels that they also provided or made huge sacrifices in Yemen and they invested, they created their own proxies, they're considering themselves as a key actor and they helped Saudis. But the competing interests of Saudis and Emiratis have always, uh, I mean, uh, have always been an issue uh, in terms of uh, how the, 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 the talks move forward and uh, in, in terms of the pace of negotiation, whether they would result in uh, achieving peace or not. Uh, so Saudis now feel they're more confident, they're more comfortable in their talks with uh, Houthis. They're just trying to get concessions from Houthis uh, because Saudis apparently have made concessions. Uh, in, in the second half of December, the Yemeni government uh, tried to stop some of the oil shipments from entering the ports of Hodeida, and it was Saudi Arabia, if, even before people felt there is that sort of progress between Saudi Arabia and uh, Houthis. Uh, people, before even the UN started to articulate that, uh, that sort of belief that Saudis are making progress with, with Houthis, uh, as well as the uh, European and, uh, I mean, the, the Western diplomats. Everyone is now hoping that Saudi Arabia would make progress and would reach uh, an agreement with Houthis, even if this comes at the expense of sidelining the PLC, the Yemeni or the internationally recognized government, as well as the UN-led uh, peace process. But we need to make a pause here. Even if Saudi Arabia, I mean, reaches or makes, uh, whether Saudi Arabia reaches a peace agreement with Houthis, is this what the Yemeni people want? Or is this the peace that would last? And this is one of the concerns that Anil uh, has, uh, I mean, referred to, that Yemenis might be concerned. Uh, yes, now so, uh, Houthis have stopped the cross-border attacks, Saudis seized their airstrikes, 
But if we look at the situation in Hudaydah, for instance, uh, just last week in Hudaydah, for instance, uh, last week in Hudaydah, uh, I would say between uh, February 15 and 18, uh, Houthis in, in, in farms of an area called Al Hajrufa uh, clashed with the, the, their, their, their uh, rivals, uh, the joint forces uh, uh, in the, the West Coast. And the number of casualties have exceeded uh, 70 fighters who fall uh, between dead uh, and injured. And in the last week of November, if we see what was happening in the last week of November, between the 30th of November and the 6th of December in Marib, uh, Houthis launched repeated attacks on the government uh, troops stationed in the southern uh, front of Marib city in Al Balk mountain. And uh, hand, uh, dozens of fighters were killed uh, in Marib then. Uh, if we go back to to the last weeks, uh, last weeks of uh, of December and the early weeks of January, we have in the West Coast hundreds of fighters from both sides. Uh, Houthis launched uh, and mounted a major offensive to capture areas in a third area in Hayes, in, uh, uh, in Al-Hajrufa, in Al-Khukha, in several parts of Hudayda. Uh, they, they, they started the attacks uh, between December 11th and they continued the attack until the first day of the year until January 1st. Uh, they, I mean, the, the number of casualties have exceeded hundreds of fighters. Uh, but this is not the most in interesting development to look at in terms of whether uh, the, 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 whether there is real truth or whether the Houthis on the other side or the rivals are committing to keep the situation calm. What is interesting is what was happening in Bani Hushayt in Sana'a. Bani Hushaysh is one of the districts that has always supported Houthis, even when the Yemeni government fought Houthis between 2004 and 2010. Uh, Bani Hushaysh has a majority of residents that support Houthis more than they support uh, their rivals, whether the Yemeni government or others. Houthis have engaged in fightings and clashes with the tribes in Bani Hushaysh, and they, these people are their supporters because of the Houthis' practices on the ground. Houthis also uh, had several rounds of infighting in Al Jauf. And Al Jauf is also one of the governorates that supported Houthis and provided hundreds and maybe thousands of fighters to support Houthis. Uh, in, in, in between November and December, uh, the Hamdan tribe and the Bani Nof tribe forced the leader of the Houthi group uh, to request for a ceasefire. And, uh, to start a sort of arbitration and mediation committees. Uh, the, 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 the leader of Houthis, Abdul Mikhail Houthi, also gave promises to Houthis, uh, to, to, sorry, to the tribes that they will not uh, continue their attacks uh, that aimed at grabbing the lands uh, of uh, the, the, the tribes in Al Jauf. The same development was seen in Eb when Houthis. Uh, uh, besieged the old city of Eb for more than two weeks just to arrest their critics and to arrest those people who criticize the group. There is a growing anger against the Houthi group. There is a growing frustration at the way they're administering uh, the situation, but it is not because of the lack of resources. It is not because they're not controlling the oil. It is about how they're trying to change the social order and the identity of the community. People, are, and especially young people and their families are now concerned about what the new Yemen would look like if it falls under, uh, in the hands of Houthis. Much of the blame goes to the competing interests of Saudi Arabia and UAE, but it is also about how this conflict is being depicted as a conflict between Saudis and the Houthis, between Iran and Saudi Arabia. It is also a conflict between Yemenis and the Houthis. Uh, what, and, and, and I, if I may just for one minute add something about the PLC, this is also one of the concerns. There is much division uh, for, for the other forces that, uh, for the, 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 that uh, oppose the Houthis. If, if, we, if, if we look at the PLC in its current situation, it is 
very much fragmented. It is weak in terms of the competing interests of the regional forces. UAE uh, is trying to polarize some of the members of the BLC to speak or to at least uh, defend the interests of UAE uh, and not the interests of the Yemeni people. If we had a PLC that is unified, we would at least have another force that could uh, could force the Houthis uh, agree on a peace deal and not at a very uh, uh, not at the very last moment raise the bar high and start uh, bringing demands that not the other parties would accept. Like in the last time when the uh, truce expired, Houthis just brought a last minute demand when everyone was hopeful, everyone was optimistic. The US was optimistic, the UK was optimistic, the Western diplomats were optimistic that now there is a truce that would be extended for six months. And on the last day, the last minute, Houthis said, no, you need also to pay for the military personnel. Uh, uh, and this wasn't on the table. It was maybe something that Iran brought in the last minute just to hinder that deal. Maybe the, Houthi, the Houthis themselves, because they find the group be able to thrive in such circumstances and not in, term, uh, not in times of peace, because Houthi's problem is with uh, Houthi's pro problem is that they're ready to make peace with Saudi Arabia, but they're not ready to make peace with Yemenis. And the question is, if there is peace with Yemenis, how Houthis can continue uh, to have that sort of influence, not only on the areas they held, but also how to expand and have influ influence uh, on the other areas uh, under the control of their opponents. Over to Europa. Thank you, Yazid. Ahmed, over to you. Thank you so much for the invite first. I'm so happy to be with you. Um, and thank you, um, Anil and Yazid, for you know, uh, sharing your uh, readings about the situation. I think it uh, it makes my mission uh, so easy, actually, to, to add to what you mentioned. Uh, from my side, I'll be focusing more on the domestic kind of regional um, uh, dimension. Because we always refer, and this is actually what uh, Anil mentioned, we are almost in the ninth year of the conflict. And, and, and the conflict is not just, you know, going in a steady way. I mean, we have so many, you know, changes, so many transformations. And when it comes to the truth, we can read it from this lens. We have huge transformation actually happened just last year. And it's because, you know, um, in my perspective, two main things. The first one is the um, fatigue uh, among all the warring parties, because after, you know, eight years of conflict with um, no, I mean, with no ability to achieve, you know, that big significant, um, you know, achievement, uh, we ended up with some sort of, you know, tendency among the warring parties to look for different, you know, routes of dealing with the situation. And here we can understand why the um, both, I mean, the Saudi-led coalition and as well as the Ansarullah movement, the Houthis moved towards, you know, having something beyond uh, the, uh, 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 you know, wars and, 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 and you know, uh, confrontations. Uh, in my perspective, we have four kind of transformations that we can see clearly in in in, in Yemen nowadays. The first one is, uh, perhaps this is clearly from the Saudi side. We are moving from you know military strategy to having some sort of hybrid strategy. So instead of just focusing on hard military strategy in Yemen, fighting and opening fronts in many areas. They are trying to come up with different, as I mentioned, initiatives to reach some sort of understandings with the Houthis. And from the other side, they are trying to, you know, um, focus on their aligned forces, secure some sort of, you know, uh, areas of interest. And I, th I think this is something very important to look at. Um, and 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 they they look at their rule in Yemen as they are a mediator, not just, you know, um, against one specific party. And Yazid mentioned that the Houthis, um, you know, were invited several times to Saudi Arabia, 
the Saudi Arabia is trying to play this rule because it, it has been always the case when it comes to Saudi Arabia intervening in Yemen. They always, you know, uh, portray themselves among Yemenis as they are, you know, the big brother. So this is actually the idea of the Saudis. Um, and, and from the other side, the Houthis have been actually trying many times to go to Marib. The last offensive, you know, was very intensive in, in um, you know, last, uh, last months of 2021, but they couldn't make it. And of course, you know, the airstrikes were heavy that moment. So at the end of the day, they found themselves un unable to do any sort of breakthrough in Marib. So uh, for them, Marib seems to be like, I mean, locked uh, because of the, you know, um, this kind of resistance. And at the same time, the redeployment of the Saudi-led coalition bringing the giant forces from the western coast to Shabwa, who uh, managed to restore many districts there. Uh, and the third actually point with this shift is the, and this is something very important, is the impact of the Ukrainian crisis on Yemen. I think this is something, you know, uh, has lots of things to do with the, you know, energy sector, because um, you have, you know, high demand, the energy market became, became you know, uh, focusing more on uh, what is produced in the Gulf countries. So most of the Gulf, um, you know, states don't want to see any sort of attacks coming from the Houthi side against, you know, Saudi Arabia. So this is the first transformation. The second one is moving from the, you know, um, war to control areas to the economy warfare, warfare. because um, in, in the past, for example, you know, seven years, we used to measure, you know, the power of every party by uh, how many, you know, governing, uh, governor rates they are controlling. And based on that, we can say, yeah, this is actually a strong party. But now we are moving to another actually dimension. The Houthis, for example, and this is actually for the first time, uh, attacked, you know, oil facilities in Shabwa and Hadramut, and they are asking for, you know, more economic resources to be shared with them. Um, and and they, the, the, the last, you know, uh, round of negotiation between the Houthis and Saudis are heavily focusing on how they can, you know, um, address the economic hardship in their areas. So this is actually one one thing you know we can we can see clearly either actually on the ground or through the different you know um, uh, talks and negotiations, um, and um, and and speaking about the Houthi demands, uh, we can see also the Houthi um, you know um, shifting demands as well because they they used to say look we are just I mean um, talking about humanitarian situation. And, and focusing how we can do some sort of, you know, necessary measures to, um, you know, uh, reduce this kind of, of uh, humanitarian hardship. But again, uh, this is actually the case of the beginning of the truce, which was, you know, on Sana'a Airport, uh, Hodeida Airport, and from other side, you know, the uh, discussions about the internal routes. But in the in, in the last actually uh, round of talks, they are mainly focusing on the salary payments of civil servants and you know security slash military personnel. Um, and the third uh, transformation related to um, and this is actually something very interesting. You know, um, the warring parties are moving from you know front lines to internal fronts. For example, the Houthis when they stopped you know. Um, you know, when, when, when the truce started in April and there's some sort of, you know, um, um, halt in many fronts, they just returned to their, you know, um, areas inside, you know, uh, the northern part of the country and, and started what is called, you know, the uh, reforming of the, um, you know, internal fronts. So they started, you know, this campaign of, you know, uh, uh, women-related policies, mahram, uh, guardianship uh, into brackets, um, uh, more restrictions against women. In schools, for example, they do some sort of, you know, changes in educational curriculum, as Anil mentioned. Uh, and it's like, I mean, um, um, a whole matrix of, of, of changes. 
And in their perspective now, yes, we don't have any sort of military confrontations, but we need to fix something within you know, the society. And I totally agree with, with Yazid. There's a lots of resisting coming from different tribal local communities against, you know, these kind of security grip and security um centric policies coming from the Houthis against different, you know, um areas and and, and different, you know, um uh, issues. Uh from the other side, also from the PLC, we saw, you know. Uh, so many divisions. I mean, if we just speak about, you know, what happened in Shapua between the uh, the Emirati-backed forces and um, some of the Islahi-affiliated, you know, um, commanders, it's actually something very interesting to look at because while we were expecting more unified stances coming from the PLC, we saw this kind of divisions. And I think... Um, um, uh, as long as we we are seeing lack of of um, you know dialogue among the uh, PLC entities, of course we can see this kind of state of fragmentations among different entities um, who are within you know uh, the PLC. And and the last uh, transformation in my perspective, and this is related to what uh, Yazid mentioned uh, in his last point. Um, is, you know, we are seeing the warring parties are talking nowadays about, yeah, I mean, the war seems to be um, going through negotiation or at least political talks, but what is the vision to end the war in Yemen? I mean, how we can move to, you know, some sort of um, um, non-conflict time in Yemen. This is at least, you know, the thinking of many uh, 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 local local groups in Yemen. Nobody, I mean, this is actually uh, through my conversations with many warring parties, um, nobody actually has this kind of realistic vision about what should be done. They started actually with zero sum narratives about, yeah, I mean, if we talk to the Houthis, they, yeah, they look at Yemen as they are, you know, the only representatives and uh, the other parties are just mercenaries and they are a part of the Saudi-led coalition. If you go to the you know internationally recognized government, the PLC, they I mean view the Houthis as they are you know militias and they are not you know um, uh, they cannot see them as a part of any sort of of, of you know uh, political compromises. And if you go to the STC, they have this kind of uh, se separation. I mean uh, uh, or independence idea about the south of Yemen. So these kind of you know conflicting visions. Um, are you know the the let's say dominant ideas in 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 the past years, and they're still there despite the fact that we are moving to you know some sort of political talks. Um, and and as I mentioned, there's no you know uh, a clear vision about how we can deal with all these kind of challenges, this kind of you know problems we have. Um, and 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 what makes things worse, I think we don't have you know agreed references. The National Dialogue Conference outcomes, for example, was you know the main reference that many warring parties, at least uh, in the anti healthy uh, camp, are referring to. But I don't think this is the case now, given you know the um, you know new realities and the um, changes within the uh, uh, different areas in Yemen as a result of the conflict. I'll stop here, and if you have any question, I would be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Yazid, you mentioned the Saudi Houthi back channel, and I was wondering whether you all think that a breakthrough could be produced in that back channel. Because as you alluded to, Ahmed, um, the Saudis would likely have to acknowledge Houthi control in a large part of the country. So um, do you see a breakthrough coming out of that those discussions that they're having bilaterally? The question is for Ahmed or for me, Roba? It's for everyone. For you uh, if I may. and for Ahmed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe if I'll start Ahmed. Uh, I don't think that would uh, have a significant achievement, even if Saudi Arabia manages to bring the 
Mahdi the, the Houthi president, Mahdi al-Mashad, to Saudi Arabia, even if Saudi Arabia manages to portray itself, as Ahmed said, as the bigger brother and the mediator in the Yemeni conflict. They, they, they just want to say to the world, see, it's Yemenis who are fighting, we're providing this platform for Yemenis uh, to come to Saudi Arabia, and that would be a huge diplomatic success for Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, that wouldn't change realities on the ground. When w w I was referring to the offensive that Houthis had uh, in Al Hudaida uh, between 24th of December and the first of uh, between 11th uh, of December and continued until the first day of January, and then they followed. Uh, they followed even in the following weeks. Last week we had also dozens of fighters who uh, fell between killed and injured. Houthis are trying to test the defense line of these forces to see if they're ready for what might appear to be next. If they manage to agree with Saudi Arabia or reach into an agreement, uh, Houthis would be also interested in expanding their forces towards other areas uh, controlled by their rivals. Uh, Houthis would always have that interest in reaching to the oil resources areas, uh, and they would never give up that idea. So the agreement between Saudi Arabia and Houthis might be just a one stage after which we're going to move into another uh, fighting, especially with, with the other forces. We have the STC, uh, UAE-backed forces uh, that are administered by the Southern Transitional Council. They're fighting almost every day. In Al Haddiyaf, uh, in Lahj, uh, in, in, in Al Hawamira village, in Al Qabayta district, uh, in Lahj, uh, in Al Valley. They're fighting Houthis almost every day. Houthis have employed hundreds and now maybe thousands of drones. I'm, I'm following on daily basis the, the, the battlefields, the fronts, and every day we receive reports of tens of drones. We receive uh, reports of uh, offensive and infiltration attempts made by Houthis. But the other groups seem to be prepared for the next. And that was the scenario everyone was preparing in case the, 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 the truce collapses and Houthis uh, resumes ground attacks uh, on the other fronts. Everyone is prepared and everyone want to have a say. Now, the problem with the BLC is that STC, which is a very important component of the PLC, STC has its own association agenda. They want separation, and they want to bring that to the table of negotiation if they negotiate with, with, with Houthis. Everyone is prepared that maybe Islah got weaker, one of the components and one of the parties that has, uh, I mean, uh, one of the members of the PLC, maybe they're at a weaker stage now. But if we look at the composition of the PLC forces, everyone is ready and we can't expect what is coming uh, what is coming next and that is the, the that is the, the challenge today ahmed if you have something to add. Uh, thank you adding to what you mentioned Yazid. i think um, we are seeing indicators in both ways um from you know the positive side we are seeing some you know um indicators that saying i mean giving some sort of hope that the Houthis might, with the Saudis, reach to an agreement. Um, we saw, for example, you know, the uh, Omani delegates visited Yemen twice. We saw the Saudi also delegation visited Yemen. And there are some, you know, reports talking about, you know, um, the Saudi ambassador was among them. And I think this is something um, very, very important in terms of, you know, um, this type of back channel, or this kind of you know communications between the two sides, um, and and what we are hearing also there are lots of progress in terms of the topics uh, being discussed between the two sides, um, and the Houthis, for example, also um, released um, a prisoner pilot, a Saudi prisoner pilot, uh, without anything, actually. It's like, I mean, this is, you know, um, uh, to show we are, we are willing to have this kind of, of, uh, um, you know, agreement. But on the other side, we are seeing also some clashes, as uh, Yazid mentioned. I mean, uh, either in, in Lahj, Dala, Al-Jaw, for example, uh, or 
near the borders, actually. There are lots of reports talking about some uh, clashes, at least from the Saudi perspective, from the uh, healthy media stations. Um, and I think this can lead also to more escalation if there is, you know, any sort of, of you know, clear agreement tackling all these kind of issues. Uh, in my perspective, if there is, you know, um, if there is a, an agreement between the two parties, you know, um, even with the, you know, main topics that being discussed, like, I mean, the increasing the, the, the number of flights uh, in and out Sanaa Airport, lifting the, 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 some sort of measures on, you know, uh, Hodeida Port or the salaries, uh, besides also some um, um, security uh, measures in, in the main front lines. If we say this, we can find some sort of frozen conflict. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that as like, I mean, the, the, the best case scenario. Uh, then based on this frozen conflict, you can talk about your yeah, next step to take it to more, you know, uh, political um, uh, phase and start talking about multi-party uh, discussions among the local parties with the Houthis. And then you can, you know, uh, uh, expand this kind of understandings to include more, more topics in the future. Thank you. And now one of the questions that we got in the chat was uh, focused on what's at stake for the US. So could you talk a little bit about that? Also in the context of this debate that we have had in this country about offensive and defensive weapon sales to Saudi Arabia in the context of the conflict, does the, the distinction even matter? Thanks. So, uh, you know, this this question of of what's at stake for the United States and for U.S. interests does kind of depend on on who you're speaking with. Um, to a certain extent, I think a lot of unfortunately Yemen policy has tended to be viewed through the lens of either U.S. Uh, concerns about Iran in particular. Uh, motivating opposition to the Houthis, as well as a desire to prioritize the U.S.-Saudi relationship. The Saudis are the largest customer of the U.S. weapons manufacturing industry. And so when Congress had moved to potentially uh, curtail or end um, the, the kind of support that the U.S. provides to the Saudis as a result of these you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of weapons that the US has sold to Saudi Arabia over decades. Um, it, if, if that had been severely constrained by war powers resolution, for example, the, the concern was that would really upend the US Saudi relationship. And in particular, you know, Ahmed had pointed out in the context of the Ukraine crisis and the strain on energy markets at present, I think that that is crucial. Um, to keep in mind. Uh, so, so obviously the US is no longer actively dependent on Saudi oil in, in the way that it once was, but the US economy and the global economy remain dependent on fossil fuels and Saudi Arabia remains the sort of producer of last resort that, you know, as we saw last fall, there was that concern that the Saudis were gonna cut production and drive up the cost right before the midterms, et cetera. So I think for, Unfortunately, Yemen policy does does tend to be viewed through these kind of broader um, geopolitical lenses, and there's not necessarily as much of a focus uh, on just Yemen itself. Although, arguably, the appointment of Tim Lender King uh, was uh, useful. You know, having someone dedicated to trying to to speak to the the parties inside Yemen and to really try to prioritize. Um, uh, sort of the the perspective of of Yemenis and uh, trying to move beyond just kind of seeing this as a proxy conflict. Um, so the you know another another question is as you can see in the map behind me you know Yemen is a very important uh, strategically important location in terms of control of the Bab al Mandeb Strait, which does lead to the the, the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. Um, 
you know, we were all reminded of the importance of the Suez Canal when the, the ship got stuck there <laughs> last year. I mean, this, you know, this question of, of shipping routes remain of, of crucial importance to the global economy. And so there is this concern of if the Houthis do consolidate control, what impact might that have on this, this important shipping route? Um, but, you know, I do think more broadly, um, there is kind of, you know, I've, I've heard Yemenis express frustration with the extent to which this has also become kind of an American domestic political football and the way that, it, you know, under Trump, it was used as a means, the war powers resolution was used as a means of signaling opposition to Trump. And now it's, you know, Congress trying to reassert its, reassert its con constitutional authority to, to make war or to declare uh, when, when the US military can be involved somewhere. Um, but, you know, from, from the perspective of, of someone concerned about what impact that may have on the ground in Yemen, you know, this, this notion of, of congressional war making authority um, is probably not front of mind. And in general, we know that Congress has tended to abrogate this responsibility consistently. Um, and so the notion that they would reassert it now, again, seems somewhat unlikely. Um, to your question about offensive versus defensive weapons, I mean, this is something that, you know, IR scholars continue to debate, you know, how do you, how do you distinguish an offensive from a, from a defensive weapon? Um, we did see when the Biden administration came into power that they declared that they would end um, new sales of offensive weapons, uh, and they did pause an existing weapon sale. Um, however, again, there, there were other sales of things like attack helicopters, for example, and so there is a question of, well, is that a defensive weapon? Is that an offensive weapon? There, there was an effort um, from Congress to try to get the Biden administration to clarify a little bit more what was meant by that, given that it is a notoriously difficult distinction to draw. Uh, I guess I'll stop there since I know we're, we're um, running a little low on time. Thank you, Yazid and Ahmed. I'm wondering whether you think that Marib is still an essential part of the Houthis military strategy, you both referenced and Anel as well, the difficulties they encountered in trying to take Marib last year um, that eventually led to the ceasefire. Do you think that that will be the um, first place where we might see the conflict reignite if these discussions in the Saudi Houthi back channel and the UN discussions fall apart? Uh, Yazid, can you go first? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, observing the situation on the ground, uh, we've seen Houthis are now investing in, in, in getting more hands on, 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 on the ground in Marib, but in a very indirect way. Uh, they're trying to recruit and get the help of uh, tribal leaders in Marib, those who were uh, supporting the Yemeni international. Uh, the internationally uh, recognized government. Uh, there have been a series of assassination, uh, assassination incidents in Marib. And now more speculations go to accuse Houthis of uh, being behind those uh, assassination attempts. Also some of the conflicts, uh, so, so some of the clashes that have erupted with, uh, in Abida, in the Abida tribe, between tribesmen and the security forces. There are more speculations and more evidence that Houthis are, 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 are behind these sort of uh, uh, security dilemmas in, 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 in Marib. This, in one way or another, shows that Houthis are still interested in, in either capturing Marib or at least in uh, making some sort of uh, so, some sort of uh, agreement with, uh, or at least understanding between them and the local tribes on the ground in the event that they agree with Saudis, it would be closer to them uh, to approach Marib and advance. Uh, Houthis are investing a lot in Marib and they have never stopped uh, that sort of investment. Uh, as Ahmed said, uh, the, the Houthis uh, when the Saudi ambassador uh, visited Sana'a with the Omani delegation, they, as a good sign, as a good gesture, 
they released uh, a war prisoner who's a military pilot and uh, handed him over to the Saudi ambassador. They're also given another good sign and gesture for the Saudis that they're not attacking or they're not launching a major offensive against Marib because Saudis have always considered Marib as a very strategic location, important to their national security. And uh, this, is a, this is another gesture from Houthis to the Saudis while they're attacking the other parts and they're putting more weight on the West Coast. So Marib is always on the agenda of uh, the Houthis and they, Houthis on, on the long run, even if, if they receive more concessions from, the, uh, from Saudi Arabia, can't respond to the public anger and frustration for why they not paying the salaries. They at least need to answer that sort of response. And in the case, they even reach an agreement. They need to convince the public that we were not able to pay the salaries because we were not controlling the, the revenues uh, come from Marib and Hadramut and Shabwa. Ahmed? Yeah. Um, thank you, Yazid. Um, I, I'll just add some, some um, uh, just few words to what uh, Anil mentioned about the U.S. Um, policy in Yemen. I think, uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. The problem with the U.S. policy is that they look at Yemen from purely security lens, and they look at Yemen as just a place for Al-Qaeda, which is, you know, based on the um, U.N. statistic, they are talking about 10,000 members. But at the end of the day, you have, you know, more than 30 million Yemenis, actually. You need actually to, to have this kind of constructive uh, rule and to have uh, this type of non-security Yemen-centric policy. This is something important. Or, as you mentioned, look at Yemen. for They are looking at Yemen from the neighboring countries lens. They, they have some sort of interest in the neighboring countries and how they can, you know, evaluate or assess the situation in Yemen based on, you know, um, how they can, you know, keep um, their interests in, 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 in the neighboring countries. And I think this is something, um, you know, lead to so many uh, 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 mistakes um, from the U.S. side uh, in Yemen. Um, what we witness, and this is actually something should be uh, highlighted, what we saw in the last, you know, uh, year uh, with Tim Linder King, I think they are doing some sort of constructive rule, working with the Omanis, uh, the UN Special Envoy, for example, are benefiting a lot from the American influence. And I think this kind of, of things should be expanded and we should build on it. This is actually something important to, to, to mention. Um, um, when it comes to Marib, we always refer uh, to Marib as it's like an economic hub for Houthis that they are looking for. Um, uh, but I think uh, Marib is useless if 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 uh, the Houthis take it alone. If they take Marib, they should go to Hadramut and Shabwa because if you are you know uh, controlling Safar refinery, for example, you need to export, and to export it, you need to either fix the pipeline, which is from uh, Safir to Hudayda, or uh, try to go you know, beyond Marib to Shabwa and Hadramut. So there is a huge risk. And this is actually very clear from the Saudi perspective. And they, they know that if the Houthis manage to take over uh, Marib, um, the situation will be will be difficult in the areas after after Marib, and they will lose you know, many territories. So that's why they are focusing more in, on on supporting the um, you know forces uh, defending Marib, um, and the second thing, and this is from the Houthi side, um, even if they manage to take Marib, is there any sort of acceptance among the Marib tribes because they are facing lots of difficulties with the Jauf uh, tribes, for example? They took over Al Jauf, and Al Jauf today is under the uh, control of the Houthis. But every day they have this kind of, you know, disputes with the tribal communities, because at the end of the day, you, the tribal uh, communities have their ecosystem when it comes to, you know, um, local governance, how they deal with, you know, 
um, uh, local authorities, and they don't want any external actors to impose something on them. And this is similar to uh, Marib. So it will be very difficult for the Houthis to, I mean, to move to Marib and to control this large or vast areas without having, you know, clear uh, strategy about how they can manage it. So this is the point. Thank you. Um, my next question is for all of you. Uh, and Ahmed, you mentioned the references for Yemen. One of the references is obviously UN Security Council Resolution 2216. And Bruce Rydell from Brookings recently wrote a piece about um, the relevance of that resolution now. As you know, it calls for the Houthis to fully withdraw and the restoration of the Hadi government. And Bruce argues that we need a new resolution that effectively calls for the end of the Saudi blockade of Yemen. And that would be a starting point in terms of uh, UN negotiations. What do you all think about that? Um, I think um, there is no need, there is um, 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 uh, need to, to have different kind of strategy coming from different, um, you know, uh, international actors. And when it comes to the UN security resolutions, of course, I mean, we need to change something based on the new realities. But is it, you know, the main challenge, the main barrier that we are having that, you know, hindering many things happening on the ground? No, I mean, this is the short answer. Uh, and I think we can um, have it face by face. I mean, try to fix something on the ground. If for example, you know, the Saudi Houthi talks led to some sort of broader multi-party Yemeni talks. We can move to, you know, another phase where we can fix different type of references, including the UN security resolutions. I mean, it's easy, I mean, to, to uh, bring the um, international actors and um, uh, push them to agree on some you know, um, uh, good, let's say, references that help the parties inside Yemen to, you know, move towards political pathway. Uh, but if we are assuming that, oh, we can change today the UN security resolution and the situation will be completely different tomorrow, I don't think it doesn't work in Yemen um, uh, in this way. Um, so we need, we need to have this type of uh, multi- uh, track strategy where we can, you know, work on the ground, work with the avail available, you know, uh, channels that we have, and then we can reflect the results of these channels on the other references and I try to to um, you know uh, bring them to support this this uh, uh, this track as I mentioned. And now, Yazid, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll try to be uh, uh, brief. Uh, well, one of the problems with the UN resolutions uh, after the Saudi-led intervention took place in March 2015 uh, is that it gives no power to the UN Special Envoy in Yemen. Uh, and it, it might look as it is favoring Saudi Arabia uh, to Houthis. And this is this is affecting the work and the influence of this uh, UN special envoy as a mediator. By the end of the day, Saudi Arabia could go to Houthis, negotiate with Houthis, and aim at striking a deal, even while they're sidelining the UN special envoy. The UN special envoy has no tools, has no framework, clear framework, and has also no vision for what a post-conflict settlement would look like uh, because he's not empowered by the UN Security Council. There are no relevant there are no relevant resolutions that support him and empower him with that strong hand that Jamal bin Umar used to have uh, after 2011. Jamal bin Umar was supported as the first uh, envoy from the United Nations to Yemen, was empowered and enabled by several resolutions that had helped him. I mean, convince parties and sometimes force powerful parties go to one table and then move to the 
uh, NDC or the National Dialogue Conference. And Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia were not at all pleased with the work of Jamal bin Omar, and they continue uh, to criticize him until the day because he presented the power of the EU and the power of the international community and the keenness of the international community to bring all actors into uh, one round to negotiate the future of Yemen. We need that sort of power given to the current UN or to any special envoy who is or any of the uh, envoys to Yemen. We have now uh, several envoys coming to Yemen. We have the US uh, special envoy. We have a Swedish special envoy. We have another one from Norway. So we, we have that sort of power with, 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 with the international community because it's not enough to bring a new resolution that ask Saudi Arabia to get out of Yemen or to stop the blockade and it empowers Houthis at the expense of forging a last uh, a lasting peace. Just given that gift to Houthis would not end the conflict in Yemen and would not give uh, uh, would not give us an enduring peace in Yemen. Thank you. And now do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with Ahmed that simply establishing a new UN Security Council resolution would be unlikely to have a, an impact on the ground. Although I do think Yazid's point about, you know, if, if one in fact were to empower the UN envoy, um, that that could maybe ha have an impact. I think um, that's an interesting thing to consider. Um, I, I, I on, on the other hand, I, I do think that resolution 2216 is is so out of date and again that the the extent to which you know it says the Houthis have to give up all their arms and give up control that it it, um, it does reiterate this the extent to which the Houthis I think feel um, that you know it's them against the international community undermines the the legitimacy of, of the UN in their eyes. Although they have been able to to work with the UN, but you know, I do think that um, probably an updated resolution would it wouldn't solve the conflict, um, but I do think it, it could be somewhere to start. I think it would also be helpful to sort of refocus international attention on Yemen, and you know, in, in part just to remind the international community of of the extent of of the crisis in Yemen, which is ongoing. And, you know, obviously, in the context of Ukraine and other international crises, um, there there's much obviously the recent earthquake in Syria and Turkey, there there's always various horrible things happening to take the world's attention. But, you know, again, Yemen remains um, in extreme uh, dire need. And I think perhaps an effort to produce a new UN Security Council resolution would help remind the world and refocus attention um, that that there's a crisis in Yemen that needs to be addressed. Thank you. So one of the things we're looking at in this um, presentation is the trajectory for the year. So I wanted to get your quick assessment on what we're headed for as we have only a few minutes left. Are we headed for renewed major hostilities or a longer period of pause this year? This is for all of you. Uh, shall I start? Um, before the, uh, I'm saying this question, let me just add to what uh, Anil mentioned. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, 2022-16 20, uh, um, uh, resolution is outdated and uh, and what is what is notable actually in, in 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 Yemen nobody actually is talking today about you know this resolution i mean people actually went beyond this you know um type of 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 you know framing and by practice actually everybody is trying to talk with the houses today from the international community um and 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 it's you know it's on the other side i mean the internationally recognized government who um, to some extent overlooked, and now we are, you know, uh, talking about this kind of, you know, non-involvement um, from the PLC and the, um, you know, Omani back channel negotiations between the Saudis and the Houthis. So, I mean, there are lots of, of, of updates, uh, but yeah, again, instead of trying to think about Yemen from um, 
you know, outside Yemen and see things from above. Uh, I think this is not the right direction. So we need to, you know, adopt this kind of bottom up strategy. I mean, try to see what type of things that can work on the ground, then we can frame them in sort of resolution, as you mentioned. Um, so this is the first point. Uh, for, for me, actually, I see this kind of long pause in, in at least in the few months, because we are seeing some sort of progress. And, you know, returning to the conflict is not the interest of any party, at least at this moment. So I'm expecting, you know, frozen conflict in the coming months. Yeah. Of course, with some some clashes from you know in in some areas from time to time, yeah. Yes, Steve. Yeah, I agree with Ahmed. Uh, we're expecting a very long pause. It's not in the interest of Houthis uh, to resume uh, major offensive because they're losing fighters, and not necessarily these fighters support Houthis. Most of these fighters fight to secure a source of income for their families. Their families that do not receive salaries, their families that need the basic uh, uh, the, the, the basic needs of life to survive. Uh, there are hundreds of people who, uh, who, who die every day, and it's not in the interest of Houthis. And Houthis feel now they have made a lot of progress because now, as Ahmed said, everyone in the international community wants to speak to them. They are, I mean, closer to Saudi Arabia, and they've always wanted to have that sort of recognition from uh, Saudi Arabia so that they can control the areas they're con uh, under their hands and, I mean, to expand in the future because they believe once they have that grip, uh, once they get closer to Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia recognizes them, the other areas would be easier to capture even without fighting. And it's not in the interest of the other forces as well. So uh, a long pause is what is expected. I, I would echo that, that I, I do think we may see a frozen conflict continuing. I do worry a little bit, though. I mean, the Houthis have shown that they are willing to jeopardize the truce by firing these attacks on oil export facilities in the south. Um, and I do wonder in particular, you know, both of my colleagues have mentioned resistance to the Houthis um, growing stronger in certain areas. And I do wonder about the extent to which the Houthis might, in fact, try to provoke a response from Saudi Arabia if they are experiencing this public pressure um, to try to reinstitute this sort of rally around the flag effect of fighting against the foreign invader, which has been really crucial to their legitimating narrative. Um, so I do think at present the reason we've seen such a, a long de facto truce has to do with the fact that the conflict reached a mutually hurting or mutually painful stalemate. Um, and, and so that's why I, I could see maybe just the frozen conflict continuing. But again, if it becomes, if, if the Houthis are facing a, a significant resistance um, or pressure from within, I, I could see them perhaps restarting. Okay, we will stop there. And now Yazid, Ahmed, thank you so much for your insightful remarks. Thank you to everyone who's joined the presentation um, and look forward to seeing you on a, a different event. <laughs>